Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to all those who are in the audience here with us today as well. Bismillah rahman rahim Well, we are continuing with our series Dawa Ilallah under the title of our comparative sciences as we investigate how to do Dawa Ilallah to our friends and our families and how specifically we are to give the message of Allah to those that we meet in our day-to-day -day lives. And we have been going through this book entitled Dawa Ilallah and as we go through it we are commenting and expanding on some of the issues raised by the author. And so inshallah we will continue straight away as not to waste any time. So brother we can continue on where we left off from the book. A. Regarding the mission of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, Verily, we have sent you as witness and a bearer of glad tidings and a warner and as one who invites to Allah by his leave and as a lamp spreading light. 3346. His role was then to bear witness, give glad tidings to those who accept his call and warn people in general of the consequences of their wrong beliefs and undesirable actions and deeds. He was to invite people towards Allah for their salvation. He played the role of a lamp to guide people to the light. That is the true path. Jazakallah khair. So what is the mission of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What is his mission? We spoke about in the first week that everybody has a reason for doing dawah. You see, dawah doesn't only have to do with Islam. There are many people doing dawah. The Christians call it evangelism. The television companies call it advertising. Politicians call it propaganda. Or maybe we call it propaganda. They don't like to call it. They call it truth. We call it propaganda. By the way, how do you know when a politician is lying? He opens his mouth. So <laughs> that's just, I'm sure I'll get a lot of hate mail. When we think of the situation in the world today, we see that the mission of many people is to call you somewhere, to something, to distract you. The whole of society has been created to keep you busy doing nothing. The whole world. We are so busy doing nothing that we don't do anything. We are so busy being entertained. Today we are no. Even while we are watching here, one of you is at home listening to this program, watching this program, and you are looking at a microscope while you're looking at a slide, while you're watching the program at the same time, and then probably on a social network all at the same time. You're multitasking. Sometimes we are so busy that we are not actually doing what we're supposed to be doing. The worst thing I ever saw was on a Friday Juma where we were all in Sajda and this young man was on his phone sending text messages. That was the craziest thing that I think I've seen. That's how we are distracted. But other than being distracted, we are so busy doing nothing. You know, these Bollywood movies go on forever. People will sit in a movie house and watch a three hour movie. Or they'll go watch whatever movie, even not Bollywood, even the Hollywood movie these days are long. And people go watch these things doing nothing. And then you ask them, so have you, are you going to come to the class that we're going to have this week for one hour? And they go, oh no, I've got no time. They've got no time, but they've got plenty of time to multitask and do all these other social networkings and, and all these other things. Find time. So the mission in life that the Prophet Muhammad was sent was specific. Just like the mission that we have in life today should also be specific. And we are distracted by so many things that are trying to keep your attention from what you are doing. The first part of his mission, according to the 33rd chapter of the Quran, verse 46, in case you don't know what ayah is, it starts off by saying that he was a witness. He was a witness. And the second, that he would be the bearer of glad tidings, a warner, and an inviter. So these are the four qualities that his mission, his purpose was. He didn't come here to entertain. He wasn't sent to amuse. He was sent here for four very important roles or tasks. To witness, to say, I am giving you what I know to be true. That's what witnessing is. Witnessing is telling people what you know to be true. So he's giving the narration as it was given to him. Second, 
He is the bearer of glad tidings. Sometimes the Haram police often get involved with Dawah. Maybe the Haram police should be dealing with those people who are already Muslims and should stay out of the Dawah field. You know, when somebody you're doing Dawah to someone, you say, you know, it is not permissible and this is Haram and you cannot do this. And if you become a Muslim, this is forbidden. And the poor person that you're doing Dawah to is going, sure, what can I do? I said in one of the talks that I did on Peace TV that you'll see, it says, if we spend our time doing the do's, we don't have time to do the don'ts. But if we spend all our time concentrating on the don'ts, we'll never get a chance to do the do's. So it's a simple formula. Look at what is permissible, and you won't have time to do the non-permissible, because you'll be so busy with what is permissible. So when we are doing da'wah, try to keep the haram police one side. We look at the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in his message, it says he was a bearer of glad tidings. He gave the good news. He told people the greatness of Allah. He didn't tell them it's forbidden for you to drink alcohol. It's not permissible for you to do this. That would come years later. The far more important message is that they knew who their creator was. Sometimes we think that somebody has to become perfect before becoming a Muslim. They become a Muslim to become perfect, inshallah. You don't need to be perfect when you come into Islam. You come broken. Light shines better through broken containers anyway. You know when you take a, a candle and you put it inside a, a pottery jug and you put holes in it and the light shines so through beautifully? It's trying through better through broken containers and cracked containers anyway. So this is what we want. We want broken people. Because if you're well, you don't go to the doctor and go, sure, there's a problem with me. I'm so well. I need you to give me medication because I'm well. You go to a doctor when you're sick. The people say, I hate Muslims. He chose Islam so that you can learn how to be perfect. So that you can learn how to fix the problems in your life. So when you come to somebody and they say to him, I would love to become a Muslim, but I had this happening to me. This guy said to me, I'd love to become a Muslim, but bacon and eggs, the best thing in the morning. There's not a chance that I could give up having bacon in the morning. I said, come into a Muslim. Come, come to Islam. Take shahada. Don't worry about that. Allah will work with you when he is ready, if he wants you to stop that. Again, about a year later, I went to the man and I said, so how's the bacon and eggs doing? He said, oh, haram, haram, I don't, haram. He became one haram police. So he was now telling everyone, haram, haram, haram. You see, Allah changes the hearts of the man. Me telling people is not going to change. He must come as he is. What are you going to do when a person comes to you and he's got green hair and he's got piercings wherever he can put a piercing and he's got chains going across and eyeline and lipstick and you go to him, oh, I can't give him Islam. I can't do dawah to him. Of course you've got to do dawah to him. He's the first person, the most important person to go to. Forget about the other normal looking characters. Go to him because he's the one who probably has more in common with you anyway. You surprised? Don't you think people call him freaks? Don't you think people look at him twice every time he walks down the street and say, look at that freak, he's crazy. He's probably killed somebody, probably buried another cat. You know, the same as they say about us, we're common with that guy. He'll be happy to speak to you. He'll be happy to see someone actually coming up and say, how's it, how are you? Sam, how are you, brother? He'll be happy. You know what you'll find that the, the metalheads and the goths and the punks and the, whatever they are, these new versions that they've got now, they are looking, they're hungry for truth. And that's why they're going through those phases that they're going through. They are rebelling against society and the norms. You'll find that those guys are made up of doctors and lawyers and scientists and professors. They're not the dum-dums of society. These guys are smart guys. I've had conversations with these guys and I've been shocked at how intelligent these guys are. Yet. The Christians won't go near them. No one wants to go near them. Those are the exact people we should be talking to. I went to a group. There was a gathering in South Africa where all these guys were there, or what everyone would call the freaks. And I was so surprised how much knowledge they had about Islam. So don't be afraid. Go up to them and speak to them. You need to give them the information, give them the truth of Islam. So this is why the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was sent. He was sent to speak to the people, to give them good news and he also once he had given them good news warned them he was a warner he said listen this is the options this is the things that are available to you however if you choose to remain in your darkness which you have the right to do there is consequences so he explained he was the first scientist that was teaching cause and effects long before we 
got taught it in high school. He was already teaching about cause and effect. And then after he was a warner, he invited people. He said, now that I've told you the truth that, uh, that was revealed to me, after I've given you the good news, after I've told you the consequences of choose left or right, then I'm inviting you. See the formula that he's given, a simple, easy formula to follow. We don't have to figure out big, complicated ways of how to give the message. We can just look at it. What do we got to give first? We've got to give the message of the Quran. What do we do second? We tell them the good news that's available to those people as well. This, this Islam is for you. What is the third thing? We warn them. We say there are consequences. Everybody will go through a day of reckoning. And then the fourth thing is we invite them to Islam. So we follow that formula. Well, let's take a break. When we get back from the break, we'll continue, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and welcome back. You are with us and we are investigating Dawa ilallah. We are looking at how to be an effective day and we are not coming up with our own ideas and own theories. We are looking at what the text itself says and the text being the Quran. And we will also be referring to some well uh, trusted and reliable hadith. So we are going to be going through that inshallah as we go through the series. And then we are referring of course to the book that we are dealing with which is a book called Dawa Ilallah. And so we are saying that we as Muslims, we have to follow the role model of the best da'i in the entire world. The best da'i. The best da'i was not Joe Soap. The best da'i was not Muhammad from Pretoria. The best da'i wasn't from Yemen. The best da'i was the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. He made the best reverts you can imagine. Imagine those first reverts because every single you know, often people think, you know, we are Muslims, we are born Muslims, we are, we are superior to reverts. Think about the, his disciples, those people who followed his teachings, that followed his guidance. His first followers were all da'is, and they were all reverts, and they took the message, alhamdulillah. There is no difference between a revert and a born Muslim, they're the same. Both of them struggle. Both of them have the same problems. Both of them have the same temptations. Sometimes to be a born Muslim is better than being a revert because you've got so much more years that you've got knowledge of Islam. And sometimes being a revert is better because the, some of the reverts get very excited. But there's no difference basically between them. They're the same. On an individual basis, you might find differences. But generally, they're the same. So don't think one is superior than the other. So when we look at the role model of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, his task was to bear witness, to give glad tidings, as we said, to be a warner to the people, to warn them. It is our duty not only to give good news to people, it is your duty to give that warning. So alhamdulillah, we see that the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, in his message was to be a warner. And of course, he was to invite them. Now, many times we have a problem with people. They say, you know, I like Islam, but it's all about law, 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 legalism, law, more law, and more legalism. And we as Christians, we have salvation. We have assurance of salvation. Now, we don't live under the law. Do you know that there is more grace in Islam than there will ever be in Christianity? Islam is a religion of salvation. Why else would the Prophet Muhammad be calling people? He was calling people to salvation. He didn't just stand there and talk and give fatwas. He was calling people to safety. He was calling people to show them there is a lifeboat. Get in it. Otherwise, you're going to drown. You can swim and swim and swim, but there will come a time that you'll eventually drown. There's a lifeboat right here. Just climb into it. You'll be safe. But people are saying, we don't know where it is. And they see it right there, and they're choosing to be blind. And so the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam gave people the message of salvation. It says that he was a lamp to the people. He showed them out of darkness into the light. So imagine you're in the pitch black and there's a lifeboat there. Think of the Titanic. Remember the Titanic? Not the movie, but the real story. The Titanic and it's dark and it's cold and it's freezing and the ship is sinking. I mean, it's the old days, so they've got these funny clothes on that are quite heavy. And you're sinking. And there's a guy standing with a lamp in the darkness of that night. And you can't even see much, but all you see is that little lamp and you hear him calling, 
Here we are. Here we are. Here we are. What are you going to do? Your Honor, it's okay. I'll catch the next lift. I'll wait for the next bus to come. <laughs> what are you going to do? You're going to make your way there. You will pull all your clothes off to make your way to that light. Watch a moth. I mean, they, I don't know how they do this, but it's, I don't know the whole scientific thing why moths do the crazy things they do. But you put a, a lamp down at night, and that moth just keeps hitting that lamp. It knocks itself silly. Have you seen them? They keep flying into it. The more, the more you push the moth away, it just keeps coming back. It's attracted to the light. And so the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was a lamp to the people, a light. They could not help but be attracted to the truth that he gave. And so our job is to present the truth to people and they will be attracted to it. We don't have to do long, big explanations. We just have to present Allah and they'll be attracted to what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave to us through the inspiration that, or through the teachings that Allah gave him and he gave to us. So we must do exactly the same thing. And so he was the role model that we should be to the people around us. He is our role model. We need to reject that. We need to be a reflection. You know, when people, sometimes there's two scholars in South Africa, I always get them mixed up. When I see the one, I, I, get them, I always get their names mixed up with each other. And one day I said to him, I don't know when I'm ever going to get this right. I mean, I've known you guys for like six or seven years. I see you at least once every two, three weeks, and I still can't get your names right. I always get them mixed up because their characters are almost the same. The way they speak is the same. The way they present their talks is the same. It's like mirror images of each other because they're both very good close friends as well. So they dress the same, talk the same, walk the same, have the same clothing on, talk in the same manner. This is how we need to be as Muslims. He said a lot of people, they become sponges instead of reflectors. You know, we want to take the glory for ourselves. We want to take the honor for ourselves. We want to take the credit. Look how good I am. Look what I did. Look what I accomplished. And we have this big list of accomplishments that we write. What does Allah see? If that's your reward. You got it. Don't be expecting anything big in the year after. You've got your accomplishments. We must be humble. One of the greatest dangers, and I was talking to some of the brothers before we came on the program today, and I was saying one of the greatest dangers is for us when we speak to you at home is to get a big head. They go, oh, look at me. I want peace TV, solution for humanity. I must be one of those solutions. And we get very big headed. We get very proud of ourselves. We get very arrogant. You know what has to happen when we leave here? We have to go do simple things to bring us back down to earth. We need to go sweep out the mosque. You have to go clean toilets. You need to go walking into the bush. And go speak to people in the rural community. Get away from luxuries and cars and, and all the fancy things in life. Become down, break yourself. Become flat again so that you become humble. Because one of the greatest dangers is that shaitan will whisper in your ear, oh, you're good. Look what you did. Look how much good you're doing. And then you'll be destroyed as a person. So we have to continuously be careful. But it mustn't be fake either, you know. Some people go like, they do it, it's all like an exhibition. You know, they do it, and then it's made sure that everybody sees it. The photographs is taken and put in the Muslim magazine or Muslim newspaper. Look how humble this brother is. That mustn't be the case either, you know. It's again the intention. We have to be cautious that we are lamps to people, to Islam. That we ourselves reflect back a lot to the people that we meet that we try to emulate the role model of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the best of our ability. It's not always easy to do. Often our ego will climb in. I mean, how do you know if somebody's dead? Take a needle and prick them. If they react, they laugh. If they don't react, they're dead. That's the way to, that's how I do it. I don't know how anyone else does it. Maybe doctors do all those fancy things and like do hard. I just stab them and see if they wake up. <laughs> if they wake up, if they wake up, they're not dead. So that's my quick, easy solution to someone's dead or alive. If your ego is alive and you think you are the main guy, if you get pricked, how do you react? Someone attacks your character. They start rumors about you in school. They start running you down in your workplace. They start saying things about your character. How do you react? Do you start saying, oh, fighting for your own rights? Or do you say, you can have your opinion. It doesn't matter to me one way or the other. But if they attack your dean, then you can defend. Then you must stand up and say, uh-uh, sorry, that's not true. But if they attack your character or your personality, who cares? If you still have your ego in control and you still think you're the bee's knees and the importance of everything, 
When somebody pricks you, you react. If you have rid of that part of you and you're living as a Muslim should because you're claiming to be a slave, not just a servant, you're claiming to be a slave. When you say, I am a Muslim, you say, I am a slave. But we are different types of slaves because some of the people are going to write to me and say, well, 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 we are bond slaves. A bond slave is somebody who got a ring. And there was somebody who was in slavery. They gave them a ring. And everywhere he walks in town, everyone could see that he was a bond slave. Which means he worked for 20 years or 30 years as a slave. His master released him. This person was so happy with his master and how well his master looked after him that he said to his master, I'd rather be a slave for the rest of my life. And then the master would put a special ring on his finger. He would have more status than a free person would have. People would get out the way. The slaves would get out of the way. The free people would get out of the way. And they would look at this man. What do you think they would say? They would say, your master is a great man. Not the slave. You're lucky. They would say, your master is a great man. Because that would be an, a reflection of the master, not a reflection of the slave. That's what happens when we become a Muslim. We have a special marking. We don't really have rings. But we have a special marking. And that marking identifies us as unique to any other species of humans. We are the greatest because we've been marked and set aside. And when we walk, we don't reflect ourselves. When people see a Muslim, they go, Allah is great. Allah Akbar. Well, as usual, we've run out of time. So you're going to have to join us again next time. Same place, same time. So for me, a Rebbe Islam, Assalamu Alaikum Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh.